this is a project was four years in the making, um, five if you count the three new pieces. I was in France at a chateau, the chateau I later learned, where uh, the Dauphin lived when Joan came. I can't. It's it's gonna. Uh, is the audio person here? Can, if I put it closer, I think it's gonna feedback. It's, it's okay. It's okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Okay. So I was shooting in this chateau just because I like making photographs in old buildings. And um, my friend and her, children, her two sons were outside. Um, they were eating ice cream. I was up in a tower. And I heard a lot of footfalls, very loud, lots, very noisy, and, and voices speaking, um, but not English. And I speak French. It wasn't French, so I didn't know what it was. Um, but I came outside, I just kept shooting, and then I came outside and I said, were there people in there? I, I often shoot in museums, and so I'm very subject to being trampled by school groups of children who come in and disrupt what I'm trying to make. Um, so I thought, oh, there's probably a school group in here. I didn't even really think anything about it at the time. And I went outside and I said to my friend, oh, did you see like a tour group or a school group? And she said, there's nobody here but us. So I did question it. I did wonder what I had experienced and um, figured I would learn from books in the gift shop what had happened there or, or you know, what, what had gone on that would make me hear things like that. So I did find out that, that it was indeed the chateau where the king-to-be, Charles, was living, basically hiding from his mother who was trying to have him killed uh, so that she could put her love child on the throne. And that is where Joan went to get an army. She thought, I can go directly to the king and I'll get an army. And they kept her there for about three months. And in the tower that I was hearing, what I, what I now think was probably the footfalls of soldiers or, or people at that time. Um, and so I started this project because I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I started shooting a lot of chateaus and, um, in the area, but just that, that particular summer. And then um, when I got back to Chicago, I realized what I really wanted to do. Um, I wanted to, to make Joan come to life in the places that she had actually been in, prayed in, stood in, fought in. So I, instead of going to India that January, went back to France for nearly a month and drove in cars all over France wherever Joan had been um, in her short life way back in the 1400s. Um, and there are a lot of statues, there are a lot of museums. Uh, little, uh, most of the towns that she ever went into has some kind of a little civic museum. So I started to photograph uh, everything from large equestrian statues to tiny little ceramic figures in these museums or in a town square, wherever I found images of her. Everything I used are 3D images of her. I have nothing like that's a picture of a painting. They're all photographs of her and um, of, of objects by other artists. But everyone has, as you can see, she looks different in every image, right? She doesn't, they don't even share any commonality. So for me, I started to think about, okay, I have all of, you know, these artists' idea of what she looked like because we don't know what she looked like. We have a, a few hasty written things from the trial that may or may not have been about her. There's no certainty. I wanted certainty for her. I wanted her to be in the places that she went. The places that she went are still there. They haven't gone anywhere. It's only Joan that's gone somewhere. So um, as the titles, I chose her own words. Uh, from letters, from the trial transcripts, anywhere that I could find quotes of things that she actually said. So each piece is titled something that actually came out of her mouth. Um, that gives her a voice. I gave her a person, I gave her a self, and then I was able to give her a voice by using her own words for the titles of the pieces. Um, so, you know, 
what's interesting is they're all the size, thank you to digital technology, I've been able to put a person who's a person's size in the places that she would have stood rather than a huge statue in a, in a tiny space. So that, you know, you have a sense of reality of her being in that place um, at that time and speaking her own words. So framing was about three years. Every frame is different and every frame was chosen for each piece. Um, some of them took me one, one uh, the, la the frame of her burning, the frame that looks as though it's been burned on the bottom over here, was the last piece I did. Um, the show was already accepted at Luma, Loyola Museum on Michigan Avenue, and I had no frame on that. And I went to my framer, and a lot of serendipitous things happened during this project, and that was one of them. They said, oh, we have a new framer. We just found somebody who has interesting frames. Here are the samples. And it was there, and it looks like it went through a fire. So I was able to frame the last piece um, in time for the show at Luma. So um, driving around, I really did get a sense of her. But what I was doing is putting other people's image of Joan into things. So when I came home, this, I, I, this is um, four trips to France total. So I'm. I'm kind of doing the Reader's Digest condensed version. Uh, but when I finally came home and I started putting them together, placing her in places, I realized that I really wanted to also shoot some people as my image of what I think Joan looked like. So I first tapped a friend of mine who's an artist and curator named Robin uh, Luzen, and I put armor on her. I took her up to Milwaukee to the Joan of Arc Chapel and photographed her as Joan the Warrior. I took my, at that time, intern uh, and photographed her as Joan the Maid. So I had those two and then I realized after I had gotten through making those pieces and finishing those pieces that I really wanted a Joan. Uh, when you see Joan with the halo effect around her head over there, that's not an effect. It was shot in the Joan of Arc Chapel in Milwaukee. And when Robin was standing in front of those doors, um, some tourist came by and opened the door, and that happened. So I said, Robin, go out. Annie, come in. And now we'll shoot you. And so that's just straight. That's a straight photograph with no Photoshopping. That's what happened when the door opened with the sunlight coming in. So. Um, I had my two girls, and then I realized, you know, this began when she was a child. She was a very spiritual child. When she was five, she was riding a big horse all by herself three miles to, to pray in a chapel, which is, uh, where is the chapel? It's the, I'll find it, I'll point it out to you. Um, so she was always very spiritual. Even before she heard voices and, and had visions, she was very spiritual. So I, I asked a friend of mine if I could borrow his 11-year-old daughter, and I actually photographed her in Evanston, and then I, and then I lifted her um, out of that setting and put her in front of Joan's house, which you'll see here somewhere, um, and uh, also put her on the path to that chapel that I was just talking about where she rode as a child. And, you know, it, it, some of the, the greenery from Evanston is in the piece with the place from France. So, you know, digit, I, I shot film for a really, really long time. Um, and digital media allows you to do a lot more things it, it, like that. It allowed me to keep some of the greenery around Joan the Child shot in Evanston and, and place it in, in the greenery in France. So um, they're, they're an addition of five. Um, the one piece, second piece in the center on the bottom, I have only two left. People seem to like these, they buy them. Um, and uh, what else would you like me to tell about it? Is it? Oh, we have the brochures at the beginning, which will have all of her words that are the titles, and they also include the ones on the side walls. Um, there is a book. The, um, the bookstore does have it for sale, and I will be signing books. So if you wanted to have it for you or sign it to someone else, I'd be happy to do that. And Chris is raffling off a book, and I will sign that to whoever gets it. So um, 
And I have my, in, my book on India, they also have some of if you're interested. So, anything else? D does anyone have questions? Yes. After walking so long in footsteps, how did your perception change? Um, not at all. It, it became so much stronger, and I feel that, uh, I actually feel like I know her. That sounds a little weird, but I do feel like I know her. Um, and, like, and I don't feel that she spoke to me necessarily, uh, but I think she's a very universal symbol for women particularly. And she is, you know, she's the patron saint of soldiers. A friend of mine's son just enlisted, and we made sure he had a St. Joan medal on with his dog tags, and he still has it. And, um, you know, there are a lot of things that she's the patron saint of, but I like, I like to believe that, you know, she is a symbol for women now. And boy, women really need her as a symbol now. So um, I think, you know, I feel like, I've, I feel like in a way I've made her live for these times. Uh, given people an idea of who she was and who she is because sometimes, you know, as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, I think, you know, to have a sense of who she was and where she went and everything here is a place that she actually stood. So I think, you know, to be able to have that and to be able to bring that back to whoever is looking at the work is very special to me. Other questions? Yes. Is there a burial place for no, um, there's, not, there's not a burial place. Um, there is a, actually the piece that is the last piece, the tall, thin one, uh, actually is where she was burned at the stake. They burned her three times. They were so very terrified of this young 19-year-old girl. Um, the church burned her three times because they were so afraid someone would get a reliquary item from her and that it would somehow you know, carry on what she was doing. It's, it's dreadful. Then they put all uh, the ashes from the third burn into the river and, you know, made sure that no one could have anything of hers. Um, so, yeah, there's no burial place. But that is exactly in the market where she, well, it's about from here to the wall. Um, that piece is on the wall and the actual barrier, burial place will be right here. And there's a tiny plaque there, but that is the memorial piece. Yes. The chapel, the chapel in Milwaukee turned out to be a bit of a disappointment. Um, I was told all these tales. You know, everyone in the world was emailing me with things when they heard what I was working on. People I knew, people I didn't know, um, and sending me, look, here's an article, here's this, maybe this will help you, which, you know, I'm eternally grateful for all of that attention to, to this project. Um, but I did, you know, I thought to go up there and shoot because I was told that it was brought to the East Coast by a very wealthy woman who had it put back stone by stone in her, uh, you know, palatial grounds, and then she donated it to Marquette when she pe was passing away, her family donated it. Well, it turns out there's one stone <laughs> that Joan supposedly knelt on to pray. So we do, I did use that stone, but I, went, I carried on with it because it is the Joan of Arc Chapel, and I thought it's a great chapel, it's built in the old style, and I, you know, I think it's, it's as good as what it might be. So that's the truth of that chapel, sadly.